what are the negative consequences it can bring on yeah i think the first kind of principle for amazon sellers to really accept or really kind of let sink into their subconscious when running an amazon business is how should sellers strategize based on how much they are getting out of that ipi scope higher the better uh the threshold yeah. i believe now is 450 if you're under 450 you have other mm -hmm. restrictions type of tools we can use and what are the kind of benefits our tools can provide us mm -hmm. uh, that's why so stock was created i was doing everything on spreadsheets <laughs>
right now. It's not usually that simple of numbers, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the general principle. Yeah. Yeah. I would, yeah. I would add to that in terms of um, mm -hmm. weeks of cover. If you have too few, if you have too little inventory, uh, Amazon actually has an algorithm uh, that will start to move you down the ranking in certain areas. Uh, it's referred to as geo ranking. And uh, because one of the, the, you know, strongest uh, promises from Amazon to their customers is this two day shipping. So if you don't have enough cover over the entire country to meet that two day shipping, if you're light in certain areas, say, you know, the Midwest, you may be in California and looking at your ranking in California and it may look fine, but in the Midwest, Amazon might be pushing you down the ranking and encouraging uh buyers to purchase from your competitors because they have more inventory and can hit that two day uh, delivery time. Got it. Yeah, I think that is uh, really interesting because uh, if I give you an example of one of our client example, so they are in craft niche and for them, the sales are not in the Q4. Their sales mm -hmm. starts from Feb to March because that is a craft season in the US. Mm -hmm. So we can see their past year's data, right? But the past year, the reviews were lower, their sales volume were lower, the ranking for keywords were lower, and now they are all these are higher. So their sales have obviously gradually increased. Now we have to predict that since the sales are coming, how much stock should we ship in? Mm -hmm. So we obviously use a few software tools to predict that out. So, but if we talk about Seller Central, uh, because Amazon also gives us a few uh, data points as well. If we are not talking about in software tools, because we are going to talk about some of the tools as well that can help us to do that. What are the some metrics or key metrics that sellers should focus on in order to determine that, okay, this is the number that we should look at when we are predicting any stocks for, uh, let's assume, uh, SKUA. What could be something like that? Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Well, you know, as you mentioned, seasonality. So if you have seasonality, you need to know what the sales pattern is. Uh, but beyond just the sales pattern, you know, to your point, looking at the trend, right, from, you know, year to year, or if you're launching a product, might be month to month. What is that trend? And, you know, additionally, if you're launching a product and you have, you don't have data, right, you don't have past year's data, but you have a similar product, you might be able to look at similar products and borrow the the trend and the uh, sales patterns from that particular product as well. God. I, I would add to Chelsea's um, mm -hmm. comment there, the kind of three key metrics we're looking at when we're trying to predict um, sizable change in uh, consumer order behavior. One is category rank. So did we break one top 100 or top 25 mm -hmm. or top 10? We typically see when that happens, um, a sizable change in unit sales, but it's also strongly correlated with a change in page views and sometimes a change in conversion rate. But the big indicator for us is page views. So at the end of the day, Amazon really controls um, what customers see when they have intention for buying a product um, and whether that's through search results, paid search ads, the automation and personalization widgets that say we recommend for you or customers who bought this also bought that. Um, all of those exposure vehicles all roll up to one metric and that metric is page views. Um, and typically page views are a leading indicator in front of a change in unit sales. So if for the past several out of season weeks, you're getting you know, a, a thousand page views a week, a thousand page views a week with some maybe 10, 20% variance. And now all of a sudden you're hitting 1800 uh, page views a week, 2,200 page views a week. That's usually a leading indicator um, to pretty strong, you know, unit demand. And then, then you need to add in, okay, clearly the season is happening now, number one, but number two, yeah. how is my ASIN in position to capitalize on that season? And that's when you follow up with, okay, I got these more page views. What's happening to my conversion mm -hmm. rate? Is my category rank changing? What's my category rank this year at the beginning of the season versus last year? Uh, but page use is a really strong leading indicator we found. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, Neta, uh, one thing we look at is uh, we are all aware of this thing. There is obviously out of stock and overstock. Now, as mm -hmm. a seller, we know how out of stock can affect us in terms of our sales and our sellers data. But what happens if we go overstock? What are mm -hmm. the 
negative consequences it can bring on. Yeah, I think the first kind of principle for Amazon sellers to really accept mm -hmm. or really kind of let sink into their subconscious when running an Amazon business is remembering that Amazon itself, while it feels like this behemoth and this Goliath and this massive ecosystem that exists kind of even outside of the realm of even the word business. At the end of the day, Amazon is also a business. It has a p &L. It has costs. Yeah. It has revenue. It has variable costs. And one of the things sellers need to remember is the number one cost for Amazon to run their entire business is grabbing your products, storing your products, and shipping your products out to the end customer. That cost yeah. in their p &L is a much higher line item than the amount of humans, the amount they spend on AWS, the amount they spend on you know, infrastructure, um, the amount of fixed costs that they have and all their buildings, all of that is minuscule compared to how much it costs to get, grab your product, store it and ship it out. And so recognizing that Amazon is operating with that being their biggest costs. And so they're going to penalize sellers that are hurting them in that biggest line item for their p &L. And they're also going to reward the sellers that are helping them deteriorate or make that line item as small as possible. So yeah. when it comes to overstock, that's when we're talking about your increasing Amazon's largest line item. And so that's why this, you know, different categories, the two to four weeks of cover is a general principle that also requires you to send an inventory almost every week or every other week to maintain that. That's not realistic for every seller. Um, and not, it's also not realistic for every category. Right. If you have a, a high season and a very, very low season then the two to four weeks of cover, you know, that, that type of thing changes. Um, but in terms of overstock, um, I think the big principle to remember is that Amazon is experiencing a high, high cost of when a seller is overstocking them and making them carry items that are not moving out the door in some relative frequent pattern. Um, that's why Amazon charges you, you know, you can kind of use the, the, the benchmark of one month is why they don't really charge you for sitting on their yeah. shelf for less than a month. And you start to get charged every month you're on their shelf. That's kind of a nice benchmark to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, you know, if, if an item's having going to Amazon and sitting on its shelf for more than a month, you're clearly mm -hmm. not fitting Amazon's business model. Amazon's business model is have a lot of customers in one place digitally, yeah. mm -hmm. have infrastructure in place to serve them with the products that they want digitally. And for the products really to flow through, flow through, flow through. Amazon doesn't want to be a, a distribution um, center or an inventory warehouse. You know, they're, they're, they call themselves fulfillment centers for a reason. Ideally, they are someone wants a product. We grab it quickly. It goes out to them. The it sitting there waiting to be purchased <laughs> is, is something that they're trying to eliminate and keep down as, as low as possible. So the, the how they penalize you is often not seen. So it wasn't that long ago, Amazon didn't even give you a score. Now you have the IPI score, you have some indication yeah. of are you doing what Amazon wants you to do or are you doing what Amazon doesn't want you to do? You have some kind of true north, if you will, um, in terms of that IPI score. But the penalization that happens to sellers that overstock Amazon, it, it, it's not seen. In you start paying for ads and all of a sudden the same ad, it just starts performing worse. Because Amazon gets to choose whether they give your ad so you're selling shampoo and you're advertising on the word shampoo, they can decide to give you more of the Chelsea impressions. And maybe Chelsea has a history of looking at the top three search results and buying one of them in the next 12 seconds. It's kind of her shopping behavior. Or maybe the Nader impression. Nader has a history of looking at 20 products, reading 30 reviews and clicking probably 10 ads before I finally make a purchase decision. To you, they just tell you, you got one impression. They don't tell you if it was the Nader impression or the Chelsea impression. And these are the type of levers that they have at their disposal. If you overstock them, you can bet you're probably going to get less and less of the Chelsea impressions and more and more of the Nader impressions. So where the penalization happens, it's often not visible. And you really just start to experience it in either loss of sales, uh, growth deterioration, ASINs starting to bog down in category ranking. And it takes if you see the penalization, it's often long after it started. Um, yeah, so just keeping that in mind that Amazon's biggest cost is holding your products, getting your products in, holding it and shipping it out the door and minimizing that the best as possible and using tools that help you minimize that, yeah. maximize your flow um, mm -hmm. is, is, is mission critical. Yeah, absolutely. If yeah. you were to look at <clears throat> the recent changes over the past couple of years, 
uh, from mm -hmm. Amazon's perspective, uh, a lot of their policies have sent a clear sign that sell through is one of the top metrics that Amazon cares about. So sell through needs to be a top me metric that sellers care about. If you look at the IPI score and the four points of the IPI score, sell through touches every single one of them. The sell through calculation is affected by every single one of those points. So if you just focus okay. on sell through, you'd be able to improve most points on your in your IPI score and avoid uh, what I refer to as the silent profit killers, which is, you know, the the storage fees, the storage fee structure mm -hmm. has changed over the years and it has increased exponentially uh, and removal fees have also doubled. So and, and not only have they doubled, but they also use uh, dimensional weight. I remember when I was selling and removal fees were 20 cents a unit, didn't matter what size the unit was. Now it exactly. uses dimensional weight and it's, I believe it's 97 cents per unit now. Uh, per No, not per unit, per cubic foot dimensional weight mm -hmm. uh, calculation. So it's just, it's, it's pretty insane. If you had a pillow, it could cost you $10 to remove that pillow. Yeah, that is expensive. I mean, Amazon is trying to say the same thing. I would 100% agree with both of you guys that you can't store your products here for a long time, right? We have our AWD. If you want, you can use that. But mm -hmm. here, send us quite few shipments, a lot of shipments, but on a frequent basis, but don't store here. Yeah, I think oh, you, you have also talked about, Jesse, about IPI score, right? So mm -hmm. what is a good number that we should chase? And let's figure out, I would add to that, how should sellers strategize based on how much they are getting out of that IPI score? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, obviously the higher, the better. Uh, the threshold, yeah. I believe now is 450. If you're under 450, you have other mm -hmm. restrictions, uh, storage, uh, storage restrictions based on a cubic level, but that that's kind of shifting a little bit. Um, they are penalizing sellers for a low IPI score, but Everything has shifted from restock limits to um, to the capacity manager. Uh, so IPI score factors into the capacity that you're allowed on Amazon. Yeah. And, um, you know, sell through is one of those metrics that if you focus on sell through, you could affect a lot of um, change. Uh, you're, you want to make sure that you don't have excess inventory to, to Nader's point. Mm -hmm the uh, having a low amount of cover and being able to keep that in stock. Uh, so I think that that as a strategy, really looking at not running out of stock and not stocking out uh, would be the, the best approach. And, you know, knowing your IPI score and visiting it regularly and seeing which of the four metrics you may be uh, suffering in to, to boost up in into the green zone because it's you know red yellow and green uh, you want to make sure that you are you have an active strategy to track that and to improve that yeah Sam, sammy i would i would add mm -hmm. too because i know we, we spent a bit of yeah. time talking about overstocks and i think chelsea just hit it here mm -hmm. on the understock yeah. topic i know you mentioned mm -hmm. um you know sellers it's pretty obvious you go out of stock you miss sales yeah. um it's extremely obvious uh, what's not so obvious is that Amazon's algorithms, uh, they don't forget that you went out of stock. So Amazon's algorithms are basically designed to say, you know, my job is to marry demand with supply, diversify, diversify that supply to make sure that the demand is over time getting the right product that they want through innovation and changes in particular categories. And so as they match that up, they say, okay, somebody wanted shampoo, I wanted to give them this shampoo, but it was out of stock. Next time this person comes and they want shampoo or another person comes and wants shampoo and shampoo mm -hmm. X is in stock, that's great. We can marry it. But note that Amazon remembers, Amazon system remembers that last time I had demand for shampoo and I could have given them shampoo X, shampoo X wasn't here. And so Amazon is cautious in giving shampoo X to that customer because Amazon's algorithms know that shampoo is a high, um, lifetime value uh, customer purchase product. Yeah. And they say, if I if this customer really likes this shampoo, shoot, I'm taking a risk of maybe not having it next time. Mm -hmm. And the system remembers mm -hmm. that and it, it, it flows through in, 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 in many, many ways. So the the impact of, of not being the supply when the demand is there 
it doesn't just have an impact on that missed sale that particular week. It had often when we were at Amazon, we would always say, if you miss a sale once, you're going to be penalized for the three next sales you could have because um, the system is just being cautious um, in, in taking a risk of, you know, Amazon is the one that is known for did we when you came back and wanted that same shampoo, was it there? Or was it not there? Amazon knows that mm -hmm. customers don't really blame Shampoo X as a brand. They blame yeah. Amazon for not having it. And so Amazon wears that badge of honor, um, you know, in a big way and, and, and takes it very seriously. Um, and so not making sure you're not going under stock um, as well is, is, is truly just as important um, in some cases, maybe even mm -hmm. more important. Yeah, I, I will add, um, interestingly, Amazon has started testing out putting warnings at the top of listings. So if you're on yeah. a consumable listing and that's a listing that goes out of stock often, they they will in some instances, and this is probably a pilot, um, but they will put a bar up saying, hey, by the way, this product tends to stock out fairly often. Are you sure you want this? Here's some other competitors that are similar. Uh, so that gets to be, you know, more right in your face and is, you know, a direct dissuading of uh, purchasing your product. Got it. Yeah, so uh, if, if we come to a conclusion, so uh, I think everything comes down to only one point, a proper inventory planning. So when we talk about proper inventory planning, what type of tools we can use and what are the kind of benefits our tools can provide us? Mm -hmm. Jesse, do you yeah. want to take it? Sure. Well, obviously, uh, that's why So Stocked was created. I was doing everything on spreadsheets and, you know, even still, the majority of, of sellers are using spreadsheets for their inventory management. Um, but the if you're going to invest in an inventory management tool, you need to understand the, the calculations and the formulas that are going into it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you don't know what the numbers are that are going into that calculation, you won't be able to trust the, those numbers, which is, uh, again, to the point why so stock was created was to give transparency of, you know, those calculations and, and not just that you need a tool to take Amazon's data and process it the right way, but you also need a tool to that, that will take that inventory planning and then allow you to put your marketing plans into that. So it's not just the Amazon data and processing the Amazon data, it's the ability to tweak that data for your entire catalog on a per SKU basis. Yeah. Nato, you want to add something? Yeah, I would just add, you know, there's a there's a human element of running an Amazon business that I think is often overlooked. And that is like mm -hmm. we all got into this business for I don't know, one out of maybe five reasons. All of them you know, are some version of to make money um, and yeah. to make money. Um, you know, we need to innovate. We need to spend time. We need to be the human that's thinking of the next great product or negotiating with our manufacturer or lower costs on ingredients or maybe even taking you know, some of the ingredients out of the cost of the manufacturer and, you know, yeah. going straight to the source ourselves. And as a human, there's only so much time in the day. And I think that's often overlooked that if you don't hand over the things that are really just math problems to smart, effective math software, um, you're going to spend yourself, you're going to spend your human time um, doing things that your competitors are handing over to software and to, you know, math problems that are being done on a calculator without the human's finger having to touch that calculator. Um, and you're going to get lost. You're going to, you know, your competitors are going to outpace you, um, right? Because they're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be stuck doing the things that their computers are doing. Um, and they're going to be spending time getting their product on Walmart and making sure their Shopify site is maximized and capitalizing on Instagram mm -hmm. and TikTok ads driving to their Amazon businesses. They're going to be doing all of the innovative things to progress their business while you're stuck still trying to um, figure out the math of not going out of stock or staying under stock um, when there's great tools out there like SoStock um, to, to that, that, that can empower you and really um, free you up and give you that one uh, kind of sanity check to know that it's, it's being handled the right way and two, giving you that time back to, to be most effective for your business and for your brand. Yeah, hundred percent agree on that. So uh, we we have talked about uh, inventory planning, sales. Now, when we talk about sales, also there's an important point that comes that is returns. 
and when it comes to returns there is sellable returns and non sellable returns mm -hmm. when it comes to non sellable returns because those are important with now all the changes that is happening uh, in amazon fees especially fba fees mm -hmm. so nater how how do you look into it like uh, for uh, because the renewable fees have increased right now so what few tips would you like mm -hmm. to add on this yeah i mean i i think um, when it comes to returns the way we approach that amazon is we just said certain categories are going to have a you know with some standard deviation some percentage of time that customers are going to return a product making sure yeah. that we have that built into our business model and accepting that up front so if i sell shampoo or if i sell TVs or if i sell mm -hmm. robot vacuums there's probably going to be a different average return rate for each of those categories making sure that i've accepted that in my PNL obviously doing what i can to mitigate it making sure that my content is articulating any any problem points well so that the customer is, is I, i'm being upfront about what those problem points are up up front so i'm hopefully stopping a sale that is likely going to turn into a return um, doing all of those pieces um, right but i think before all of that it's just accepting that what category you sell in has an average return rate um, you're 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 at best going to be some standard deviation below that with your best effective um, strategies but you know your PNL needs to be able to absorb a return rate, right? You sell products um, to customers, and not every customer you're going to make happy with your product. Uh, making sure that you've accepted that and built that into your PNL, I think, is really, really important and often an overlooked thing. It's often overlooked when you're determining which category you want to sell products in, right? People are just like, I'm super passionate about. I don't know, robot vacuums. I don't know why someone would be passionate mm -hmm. about it, but they uh, oftentimes are picking products or I have this really good connect in China with this manufacturer and they do these products really well. I think, you know, you really do need to consider average return rates in categories, um, uh, you know, in that early days of, of what category you're choosing to, to, to sell into. Yeah. yeah, I would also yeah. add um, having, you know, an inspection company that you can trust. Mm -hmm. uh, that part is key, the, the trust factor. There are uh inspection companies or in inspectors that are um they end up with the the companies they're supposed to be inspecting so it's important to know uh yeah. that you can trust the the inspectors and and also know what the reasons for returns would be so that when you have that ex inspection checklist all of those items are being checked off the list to, to uh reduce the the return rate for faulty products if I could just yeah. add one one more thing, Sammy, I would mm -hmm. it would be make sure that you're leveraging a tool or a service that is helping you proactively monitor sentimentality in critical reviews. So if 17 of your last 20 critical reviews all had the word mm -hmm. leakage in them, you don't need yeah. to wait till Amazon eventually, you know, pulls an end on cord and tells you your products pulled and you got to solve this problem. 17 out of 20 with the word leakage means your products are leaking. You need to, you need to jump in front of that as soon as possible. So making sure you're leveraging some tool or service that's helping you identify problems proactively, not just reactively. Cause by the time it flows through the SOPs, um, you're going to have lost a lot of sales. You're going to lose a lot of yeah. traction when you, you likely can jump in front of that uh, much earlier. Yeah. So uh, that was a wonderful discussion, actually. Uh, I think we are already coming to an end. So uh, Chelsea, where can people find you? Sure. Yeah. Go to sostock.com forward slash connect. You can find me a uh, demo of the software. We've got a bunch of free tools there, uh, some of them geared toward inventory um, and also geared toward logistics and how to increase profitability through logistics operate, uh, optimizations. Awesome. Neta, where can people find you? Yeah, very similarly, find us at datadriven.com, D, and then the number eight, A, driven.com. Um, and since our acquisition, you can also find us at carbon6.io slash datadriven. That's great. Thank you guys so much for joining today. Uh, it was an awesome podcast. I'll see you again in a later podcast. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Take okay. care.